How was everyone's lunch? Good. Now before I get started, I want everyone to do something. So one of the things I'm going to talk today about, which you can see on the side, is about playing small. Um, and we've talked a lot today about the big ideas and the big things, but um, I'm going to break it down a little bit and uh, we're going to talk about smallness and I'm going to uh, do some poetry for you today. So what I want you to do is I want everybody to make the stupidest, silliest, most childlike face that they can. I'm not seeing any. Come on. Let's... No, like bigger. I need big ones. And then turn to your neighbor. Show them to your neighbor. Bigger. Bigger. Good. And how does that feel? Liberating. Well, I am, in addition to being a spoken word artist, I'm also um, a student at the University of Western Ontario, and I'm in my last two months of graduating, which is a stressful time, yes. And um, one of the things that I've been realizing is that when you're getting close to a big goal like graduating, people like to ask you things like, what are your big plans? What are you going to do with your life? Will it make you any money? Um, and more and more what I've begun to realize is that there are certain things that we're told that we need to trade in as we get bigger. Um, and some of those things are being small and finding beauty in the small things. And some of those things are um, giving up a childlike view of the world. Learning how to live and be in the types of ways that we used to be when we were children. Um, and so when I was asked to be here today, I really wanted to get back to the little things because I think that a lot of us have huge passions. I know over the years I've had really big ideas and really huge, huge things, but I also think that there is so much learning to be done in the little things, and there are so many beautiful lessons that we can learn from those. Um, and in preparing for this, uh, I was working with my partner to kind of like practice and things like that, and he was like, why are you trying to be so big? Why don't you practice what you preach? And so I'm like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, you're talking about kids and you're gonna talk about playing small. So, you know, play. And so I like, kind of like wiggled around a little bit and I was like, well, this is uncomfortable. And then he was like, no, like big, like, like stretch your arms out and like yell at the top of your lungs and make those faces that you make. And, and I realized how difficult it is and that it's not just something that we pick up overnight. It's something that we practice. We have to practice playing small. Um, so I'm going to do two pieces for you, <clears throat> excuse me, today. Um, and the first is called playing small. Um, and I hope that you enjoy it. And I will note, um, in addition to my poetry, I asked a bunch of kids to do some drawings um, of some of their favorite small things, um, because I do think that this is a great way to remind us uh, how it is that we can look with a childlike view on life. Nelson Mandela once said, there is no passion to be found playing small. And while there is wisdom in these words, I will tell you. There will be days when all you can do is imagine what it's like to be molecule small. To be as little of the sound of tiptoes on wood floorboards, to be cocoa powder. Breaking small enough so I can cradle a tiny piece of you in my palm, pressed into the imprints left from years of walking around with balled up fists and hopes to be something greater than this. You. On these days, you will say that you feel frustrated. But I will be able to hear in the way that you refuse to breathe deeply that you are crumbling yourself into yourself. Breaking small enough so that I can put a tiny piece of you in my locket, strung around my neck, aligned with my heart chakra, so I can feel your energy even when you don't believe that you have any hiding inside of yourself. We are born into a world that tells us to be big from the moment that we press palms into broken ground. But sometimes, big is impossible, and the sound of your fractures will force us to be silent as you send yourself in sound waves that only a dog can hear. But know that by that point, I will have trained the surface of my skin to interpret the tiny vibrations of all of the things that you say without speaking. Sometimes, we will be old building crumble, fire chimney soot, the dirt beneath fingernails. Sometimes, we will not know how to break into anything but tiny tokens of destitute. I. Well, I wear the way that we break ourselves on my face each time I walk into your chest, letting rib bones run into me, lovingly serrate me into slivers, eyes unfolding the sorrow that I hold in when there is no place for sad faces in full rooms. I've known how to shatter before taking first steps. I've known how to grind myself into fine powders, talcum to be padded onto grandmother's skin. I have train track sutures. 
running between each of these misaligned chakras from each of the mornings that I decide to put myself back together again. I have known the sorrow to be found when there are shoes too big laid out before you, have refused to walk with souls, let the bottoms of my feet grind into dust as I walk gravel roads barefoot for fear of never being enough. We have forgotten how to be small. We have forgotten the beauty that can be found in the tiniest bits of Earth's creation. We only know small when we are defeated. We only see breaking as a sign that we are beaten. Mother Teresa once said, be faithful in the small things because it is within them that your strength lies. So today, scatter into molecules, into the sleep dust in my eyes, scatter into caterpillar legs, into plump teardrops, into eyelashes falling, scatter into shiny bits, into rough cut rubies, shatter into new cells, into the passion that can be found playing small. for you today. Um, this is a piece that I wrote for my nephew. Um, and after this piece, I'm going to end, so I will say thank you for the opportunity for being here. Um, this piece I wrote for him when he was two, and it's a piece that expressed um, the sadness and all the learning that I did in realizing that um, the ways that we look at the world as children go out the window once we start to learn adult words. Um, and so for this, I asked kids just to draw pictures of their favorite words. Um, so while I perform, I'd ask you to think about, you know, what are your favorite words right now? What are the things that you think are important in your life? And look at the difference between what, um, what kids think. And it's entitled Mumbly Blessings. I have a nephew that's two. And well, lately he desperately tries to talk in sentences, even though he doesn't know enough words to fill one up. He says, Mumble Mumble Skateboard. Mumble mumble pools, mumble mumble tools. And for a while I tried to decode all the mumbles, become a baby talk detective, listen for the sounds of different battles and consonants, thinking that when I finally decoded it, I would figure out what great things he was trying to tell me. But then I realized that even God couldn't weave sense from those sentences because those mumbles are just space holders for words that don't exist for him yet. And in that moment I became frustrated. Because I looked at him and I desperately wanted to know what he thinks about the world around him right now. I wanted to read to him from the great postmodernists like Douglas Copeland and reflect. I wanted to talk to him about the politics for Wanda. Hoping that a two-year-old brain can make sense out of something that I could just never comprehend. I wanted to sit with him and help him to learn to write poetry. I wanted to hear his first metaphor and tattoo it across my back so I'd never forget the first moment that he saw magic in something ordinary. I wanted him to grow up right now because I cannot wait to see the person he'll become. But the more that I think about it, I wish that all he'll ever know is mumble mumble skateboard, because those mumbles are just phrases caught in the breeze between him and that radiant sun that blesses him with each ray that lays its touch to his face, saying, child, be warm now. Each mumble represents a word that he doesn't yet know, and maybe if his life could stay filled with simply skateboard pools and tools, and maybe just maybe he could stay happy forever. Not yet knowing words to describe heartbreaks that hurt worse than falls off that skateboard of his, or the pools of tears we've all drowned in, we've got lactic acid build up in that part of our heart that usually t tells it to keep beating stronger. Not yet knowing words, not yet knowing words to describe tools to get your life back on track, tools for repairing breaks and cracks when everything you've known starts to fall apart. When you look at that Grand Canyon-sized fault line in the middle of your life and you wonder when it will bust you into two, and you will lie divided. All he knows right now is that he wants to be like his dad and his papa. All he knows right now is that manhood looks awfully fun with all its weird name wrenches and screwdrivers, but he doesn't yet know what monkeys have to do with wrenches or what responsibility has to do with adulthood. I ask him where his heart is, and he points to his chest. And in that moment, I want to get out a pair of needle nose pliers and kick chicken wire and cage it in, shove him in a cardboard box with a space for his face and a marking saying fragile on this side up, and then I want to roll him silly and bubble wrap until he's break proof. I want to take him to the moon. I want to take him somewhere where the sun will always rise no matter how bad you don't want it to, where the stars will always be just within reach and the nights 
Well, the nights will never be long enough to get lonely. I want to take him somewhere where the dictionary won't contain words like death, war, and genocide, where he can stay trapped forever in that mumbly-jumbly stage where heartbreak is a foreign concept in life. Life is less than a simple vocabulary. Some say children are our future, but I tend to disagree. We predict that future with the world we set up. We create clones of ourselves by raising children in the depths of destruction. We fill in each mumble with each word that we teach them. So since I can't fly to the moon with him strapped to my back, for each mumble that he speaks, I'll send a prayer to the world begging for a new beginning, begging for us all to be taken back to that mumbly jumbly stage and find peace in the simple words that come at the end of a sentence of a two-year-old boy whose heart is still cracked. Thank mm -hmm. you.